Welcome to the 18th Annual State of Indian Nations Address. We are so happy you could join us today here in the Jack Morton Auditorium at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. My name is Kevin Allis. I'm the CEO of the National Congress of American Indians and an enrolled member of the Forest County Potawatomi community in Wisconsin. NCI is the oldest, largest, and most representative American Indian and Alaska Native organization serving the broad interest of Indian governments and communities. As part of our effort to further the goals of Indian country, NCAI brings together tribal leaders, government officials, and members of Congress to discuss challenges, opportunities, and solutions to issues faced by our communities each and every day. And that is what today is all about. We have a full house today of tribal leaders, senior federal officials, students, organizational partners, and some of our strongest allies who are dedicated to working together on the issues facing Indian country. We want to thank the Piscataway people for allowing us today to be on your ancestral lands. I want to welcome each of you who are attending the State of Indian Nations in person and give our thanks to those thousands who are watching or listening to this event all over the country and around the world. Watch parties have been organized across the nation to join live stream, and this year we have more watch parties taking place than ever before. I want to welcome our partners from Congress and the administration who are here with us today. We are also joined today by members of the NCAI Board of Directors who represent all 12 regions across the entire country. I also want to recognize our future leaders here in Washington, D.C. by welcoming the students from so many college, colleges and educational programs. And we extend our thanks to Congressman Deb Hall, Congresswoman Deb Holland, who will be joining us to provide the congressional response. If you are posting on social media about the State of Indian Nations today, please use our hashtag SOIN2020. We can capture and answer questions using this hashtag, so send your questions our way. It's now my pleasure to introduce the 23rd President of the National Congress of American Indians, Fawn Sharp, to deliver the State of Indian Nations Address. President Sharp is the first woman to give this address to all of Indian country and to the country in whole. President Sharp was elected as president of NCAI this past October 2019 and is the third woman to hold the position of NCAI president. President Sharp is our current president uh, and also president of the Quinault Indian Nation in Tahola, Washington. President Sharp has dedicated her life to the rights of indigenous people. She has held numerous leadership positions within the Quinault Nation and the state of Washington, and she represents her nation and Indian country on numerous boards and communities and is a tireless advocate for tribal sovereignty. Please join me in welcoming our NCAI president, Fawn Sharp. Good morning, my name is Fawn Sharp. I consider it my life's greatest honor to have this opportunity to share with you today. I thank the Creator for gathering us together for this historic dialogue between Indian Country and the United States. On behalf of the 574 federally recognized tribal nations, dozens of state-recognized tribal nations, and millions of Native people across this country. I welcome the distinguished guests assembled here today and those watching around the globe to the 18th Annual State of Indian Nations Address. I stand before you today as a humble servant of all tribal nations, fulfilling my duty to share Indian country's story of perseverance and resurgence with the world to convey with absolute clarity Indian country's expectations of the United States government, and to cast a light on the immense power and proven wisdom of tribal nations governing their own lands and affairs, solving difficult challenges, and forging brighter futures on their own terms. 
I embrace the enormity of this task, for I have been groomed for decades to carry it out by transformative leaders in whose footsteps I follow. Leaders like Beatrice Black, Elizabeth Cole, Tiny Capoma, and Hazel Rosander, and Ramona Bennett, to name just a few. These matriarchs kindled a great fire in me to give my life in leadership to my Quinault people and all of Indian country. Just as important, they showed me the way, and for that I am forever grateful. I also draw great strength, as they did, from our almighty creator. The advice of my fellow tribal leaders, the spiritual nourishment and life lessons of canoe journeys, the inspiration, passion, and ingenuity of our brilliant native youth, and the ancestral teachings of our elders. Their wisdom, encouragement, and guidance have prepared me to meet this moment. So why do we gather here today? The purpose of this annual address is to memorialize and affirm the enduring government-to-government -government relationship between tribal nations and the U.S. government. It provides our assessment of the current health of that relationship and how it must be strengthened. This hollow discourse not only speaks to elected officials, political and ju judicial appointees, and staff of the federal government, nor is it limited to tribal leaders, employees, and citizens. It is meant for all Americans, especially those who have been disenfranchised and rendered hopeless by racial injustice, economic inequality, and the rapid decay of our American political system. They seek answers during these troubling times, and they need to look no further than tribal nations to find them. In that spirit, I stand before you today supported by more than 600 tribal nations and governments across this land to share with you this undeniable truth. The state of Indian nations is strong. Across this land, tribal nations are writing remarkable stories of cultural, social, political, and economic renewal. In the face of great obstacles, we relentlessly plow forward in our eternal quest to create futures of hope, opportunity and cultural vibrancy for our youth and those generations yet to come. We do so by invoking and practicing the greatest indigenous core values of all, self-governance. The creator gifted tribal nations with certain inalienable rights, among them the right to steward and draw nourishment from our traditional homelands, cultivate extraordinary potential of our youth, develop thriving economies that provide opportunity for all of our people, and manage our own affairs and control our own destinies. As my mentor, former Quinault leader and NCI president Joe Delacruz so perfectly captured it, no right is more sacred to a nation, to a people, than the right to freely determine its social, economic, political, and cultural future without external interferences. The fullest expression of this right is when a nation freely governs itself. We Native peoples not only have the inherent right, but the sacred responsibility to live the way our Creator intended, speaking our indigenous languages, living our traditional core values, and imparting them to the next generations, practicing our life ways, conducting our ceremonies, and freely governing our lands and communities. Tribal nations are not nonprofit organizations. We are full-fledged, battle-tested governments guided by time-honored cultural principles and recognized as such in the Northwest Ordinance, the U.S. Constitution, and hundreds upon hundreds of treaties and Supreme Court precedents. However, many Americans, including many policymakers, still don't understand the unique status of tribal nations, our unique political status. They don't recognize the indisputable fact that we are genuine governments with the right and more importantly, the ability to govern our own lands and communities. <laughs> and to govern those in accordance with the values that make us who we are as native peoples. 
But through mechanisms like this annual address, more and more Americans and others around the world are learning this truth and in doing so are turning to Indian country for inspiration, direction, and most importantly, solutions to our common challenges in this great age of uncertainty. Acting with the next seven generations in mind, our ancestors endured great hardships to forge our path to this day so that we would be able to be their answer to prayer for thriving cultures, healthy children, and robust communities. We must and we will be worthy of the great sacrifices they made to give us this chance to sustain not only our way of life, but our world for future generations. We will rise to this challenge for the next seven generations by relying on the same indigenous governance principles, notably strategic vision, separation of powers, and checks and balances on the abuse of power that our ancestors have practiced for millennia to overcome the grave threats to tribal sovereignty, our freedom to be who we are, and our very existence as human inhabitants on this planet. However, tribal nations' ability to rise to this challenge is under a growing duress. The threats to tribal sovereignty and self-determination take many forms, and they come from every branch and every corner of federal and state governments. They stem from an ignorance or a hostility toward the unique political status of tribal nations as a vital part of the original American family of governments and the federal government's everlasting trust and treaty obligations to tribal nations. Yes, there have been some encouraging developments worth noting. For example, we recently saw the passing passage of the Esther Martinez Native American Language Program Reauthorization Act and the Futures Act, which permanently extends mandatory funding for tribal colleges, universities, and related academic institutions. Meanwhile, the proposed regulations updating the Community Reinvestment Act promise to expand access to capital to much needed uh, tribal governments, communities, and citizens. However, these are the exceptions to an increasingly alarming rule. Take the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA 2013 affirmed jurisdiction of tribal governments to prosecute non-native offenders in domestic violence crimes on tribal lands. Many tribal nations now exercise that authority, providing justice for native victims where none existed before. Their work has exposed critical gaps in the 2013 law that the new VAWA legislation can and should fix. Yet Congress is refusing to expand tribal authority to administer justice for victims of sexual violence, child abuse, stalking, and human trafficking, as well as law enforcement officers assaulted in the line of duty. Take the current administration's wanton interference with tribal nations' right to restore our traditional homelands, which has created an arbitrary system of haves and have-nots among tribal na nations seeking to place land into trust. Take the mounting assaults on the Indian Child Welfare Act by special interest groups intent on stealing native children from their families, communities, and cultures. ICWA has been hailed as the gold standard by child welfare experts, and its legal validity has been affirmed countless times over the past four decades. Yet, a recent federal court ruling ignored those facts, placing this vital law in real jeopardy. In addition to these existential threats, we have threats caused by federal inaction and indifference. Take the severe chronic underfunding of the federal government's trust and treaty obligations to tribal nations, powerfully illustrated in the recent Broken Promises report. This report is a troubling glimpse into the pervasive impacts that federal budget shortfalls have on the health and vibrancy of tribal communities. It comes 15 years after another congressional report came to the exact same conclusion that the United States is failing to hold its end of the grand covenant it struck with tribal nations in exchange for hundreds of millions of acres of tribal lands and valuable resources they contain. Needless interruptions and delays in federal funding also pose a significant threat. 
The 2019 government shutdown, the longest in history, is the latest example of an incompetent federal budget process jeopardizing tribal nations' ability to provide vital services to our citizens, from law enforcement to health care to emergency response. And just once in the last 22 years has Congress passed a fiscal budget on time, an inexcusable sign of a broken system. In addition, tribal nations must compete with one another for federal grant programs, a gross violation of the federal government's trust and treaty responsibilities to us. Meanwhile, Congress left Indian country completely out of the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, despite years of Hill advocacy by NCAI and our partners in promoting Indian country's tax reform priorities. Priorities that will clearly boost tribal efforts to build sustainable economies and grow local job opportunities. Congress has also neglected its responsibility by failing to pass legislation that reaffirms the inherent right of tribal governments to regulate labor permanently reauthorize the remarkably effective special diabetes program for Indians, reauthorizes the Native American Housing and Self-Determination Act to curb Indian country's severe housing shortages, and take long overdue steps to curtail the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic that is ravaging so many of our communities and families. But federal inaction and indifference is perhaps no more destructive than with the current failure of the administration and some in Congress to address the rapidly accelerating impacts of climate change or even acknowledge that it exists. As Chief Seattle once said, what we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. The damage human beings have done and continue to do to this planet disrupts every facet of tribal life, from our subsistence life ways to our ceremonies to our continued stewardship of the natural world. My nation of Quinault is already feeling the brunt as ocean sea level rise are forcing us to permanently relocate our two main villages to higher ground. When it comes to climate change and sustaining humanity on this planet, we have no time left to lose and yet our government is nowhere to be found. Finally, tribal nations face threats from an administration that appears committed to obstructing the express will of Congress. Take the Indian Trust Asset Reform Act. While ratified nearly four years ago, the administration has refused to implement key provisions, notably the creation of an undersecretary for Indian Affairs to protect and advance tribal interests within the Department of Interior and the establishment through a meaningful dialogue with Indian country of trust asset management plans. Equally disgraceful is the interagency MOA the administration developed to implement the new 477 Tribal Workforce Development Law. That law was specifically passed to expand the successful program and place self-determination squarely at the heart of Indian country workforce development. Yet the MOA was purposefully written to ignore the law by allowing federal agencies to veto individual programs that tribal nations have every right to include in their 477 plans. A dynamic the law is explicitly designed to stop. Despite these darkening storm clouds, tribal nations continue to shine brightly. We do so much with so little because our people count on us to find a way, no matter what. We devise innovative solutions to the greatest challenges facing our communities because that's what governments do. From the Isleta of the Pueblo of Isleta, whose innovative partnership with the state of New Mexico is reducing arrest and incarceration rates among Pueblo youth by providing them culturally appropriate diversionary service, services designed to set them on the right path to the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, whose Miami Awakening program is bringing back the tribe's language from the brink of extinction, and the strengthening of its people's cultural identity and kinship ties with one another in the process. To the Coeur d'Alene tribe in Idaho, whose education pipeline approach identifies and fills gaps in the systems of academic support for its students, which has dramatically decreased the tribe's high school dropout rate and increased the percentage of tribal members pursuing college degrees. 
Tribal nations are doing amazing things, and we could do so much more if the federal government would finally, once and for all, abide by the timeless pact it made with us so long ago to create the country that we share today. We have upheld our end of this arrangement. It is long past time the United States upheld its end of the agreement. <laughs> to that end, Indian country issues a new standard of accountability to the federal government to uphold tribal sovereignty and treaty rights in all of the ways for which it was has been and always will be legally and morally responsible. This accountability begins with a genuine commitment to truth and reconciliation with tribal nations, a process through which the United States can fully acknowledge its past transgressions against us so it can avoid repeating them in the future. This accountability also means affirming tribal government parity, not just when it suits one political agenda, but in every single policy decision. It requires every elected official and political appointee in Congress and the administration to learn and faithfully execute their leadership responsibilities to fulfill the federal government's trust and treaty obligations to tribal nations. For federal agency staff, it means dutifully implementing and not actively impairing legislation that empowers tribal self-determination and self-governance. For all of our federal counterparts, we will hold you to this highest standard. It is not enough that you fully uphold tribal self-determination in the specific ways your position requires. You must hold your colleagues accountable to do the same. Whenever you have a policy decision before you, you must ask, how will my decision impact Indian country? Will it empower tribal sovereignty or will it diminish tribal sovereignty? If you are charged with carrying out a policy decision, you must ask, am I seeking out and heeding Indian country's voice and how this policy should be implemented? Are my actions advancing tribal priorities? Are they obstructing them? So what does this look like living up to our new standard in practice? given the current legal and political landscape. It starts with advanced appropriations for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and Indian Health Service to protect tribal governments and communities from harmful delays and disruptions in the congressional budget process. The federal trust responsibility demands that tribal nations receive federal funding on time every time. It also means strong, flexible funding for Indian country and to end the competitive grant programs that privilege some tribal nations at the expense of others. That is just wrong. <laughs> Living up to our standard also requires government parity for tribal nations and a new approach to federal land policy predicated on free, prior and informed consent of tribal governments for infrastructure projects that will impact our lands, our communities, resources, and ceremonies. It also requires permanently protecting our sacred cultural places from exploitation and desecration. Our standard demands that Congress expand tribal authority under VAWA so we can continue to keep our communities safe and protect native women from becoming yet another crime statistic. It also demands that the federal government partner with NCAI and tribal nations to put an end to the assault on the Indian Child Welfare Act once and for all. Our children are our most precious resource and we can't prepare them to sustain our tribal nations if they've been taken away from their families and the communities to which they belong. Our standard also means fixing the land into trust debacle by finally passing a clean car cherry fix. <laughs> Indian country has been demanding this for more than a decade. A baseless legal decision does not justify legislative inaction.
It is long past time that Congress provide all federally recognized tribal nations equal opportunity to claim and reclaim tribal lands to preserve their cultures and grow their economies. Living up to our standard requires that the United States regain its position as a global climate action leader by recommitting to the Paris Accord. And re thank you. and restoring science to its proper place at the heart of its environmental policy. The United States also needs to empower the role of tribal nations in domestic and global climate action. From the Noiksuk in Alaska, to the Menominee in Wisconsin, to the Karuk in California, Indian country is crafting ingenious approaches rooted in time-honored ecological knowledge that can guide climate action around the world. Last but not least, Indian country's standard of accountability for the United States government requires a full count of Native people in this year's census, no matter where they live and how they choose to participate. The United States must also protect the right of Native people to participate in the American political process against voter suppression suppression tactics that are meant to marginalize their voice, and it must include tribal governments as equal players in the administration of elections all across this country. This is what we demand, and this is what we deserve. We will settle for nothing less, and we will exercise our rapidly growing political power and voice in Washington and at the ballot box against any and all who fail to meet this standard. <laughs> At every step and every turn, the National Congress of American Indians will be there to hold the U.S. government to this standard. NCI's leadership and staff have worked hard to strategically grow the organization's presence and strength to carry out this task, not just for this year and next, but for decades to come. So what so that we can realize our creator's vision and our ancestors' hopes for a vibrant, self-determined, indigenous future. In closing, I wish to share this message with my fellow tribal leaders and all Native people across this land. We are empowered when we make great effort and take great care to tell our stories of strife, resilience, agency, ingenuity, and prosperity to all those who will listen. We are the strongest when we think and act as one regarding the things that matter most to all of us. When we join together, we are un an unstoppable force capable of overcoming our greatest challenges and achieving our greatest and unimaginable futures and aspirations. May the Creator bless all of you, and may the Creator bless Indian country. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, President Sharp, for that important message on the strength of tribal nations and the need for unity and cooperation as we work to advance the needs of our people. We've invited a member of Congress to provide a congressional response to the State of Indian Nations Address. This year, we are very honored and very pleased to be joined by Congresswoman Deb Holland of New Mexico. Congresswoman Holland, an enrolled member of the Laguna Pueblo, made history in the 2018 midterm elections as one of the first Native American women elected to Congress. <laughs> Congresswoman Holland now serves as the vice chair of the House Natural Resources Committee and as the co-chair of the House Native American Caucus. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Holland.
Good morning, everyone. I would say that NCAI chose the right leader for this time, wouldn't you? Yes. Let me gather myself. That was very emotional. And thank you, President Sharp, for your leadership. My name is Deb Holland. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Laguna Pueblo, a single mom to my queer daughter, Soma, a daughter of veterans, a grateful fighter for environmental and social justice, and the Congresswoman for New Mexico's first congressional district. I'm proud to be here with all of you, confident about the new leadership here at NCAI, and also frightened about division in our country and the fragility of our planet. I believe the best course forward is to communicate and to unite for the solutions that we all know we can find and implement together. I want to thank my colleagues and in many cases my mentors, Chairman Raul Grijalva of the Natural Resources Committee, Subcommittee on Indigenous Peoples Chair Ruben Gallego, Native American Caucus Co-Chair Representative Tom Cole, my colleague Sharice Davids, Paul Cook, and so many others. Native American Caucus Chair Emeritus Rep. Betty McCullum. For all their work and the support they have given to me personally and on behalf of their respective important committees. The legislation that the House of Representatives has passed this year reflects the diversity that increased when women won and flipped the U.S. House across the country in the 2018 election and the willingness of my colleagues to listen to tribes. I'm so proud of your woman president. I'm confident that Fawn Sharp will lead this Congress forward and champion the issues that we know are most important to all our communities. Tribal self-governance is among those issues. And after all the centuries of Indian tribes not having full say over our destinies, it's time for the US Congress to pass the Progress Act which will provide further self-governance by Indian tribes and will pave the way for them to manage programs and resources in the most effective ways. I know that the Congress and past administrations have not done right by our communities, but today I accept the new call of accountability the U.S. Congress owes to our people, and I will do all I can to champion the issues that will help Indian country to thrive in all the areas of concern and to use my seat to hold the president, his administration, and federal agencies to account because I took an oath and that is my constitutional duty. I am also pleased to know that NCAI has chosen to honor my dear friend, Senator Tom Udall from New Mexico, who has been a champion for tribes and also for our environment. His mentorship to many native interns, fellows, and staff, and his work to bring indigenous voices to Capitol Hill will never be forgotten. I also applaud NCAI for honoring Mar Marcella Lebeau, a leader who has consistently represented her people with grace and unyielding courage. Ms. LeBeau has served Indian country and our country in the Army Nurse Corps during World War II, tending bedside in surgical tents while bombs dropped around her. She was awarded the French Legion of Honor and her legacy will be remembered for generations to come. In 2019, House Democrats managed the passage of over 400 pieces of legislation. Over 250 were bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats worked together to ensure that we are united on issues critical to Indian country, and we're especially proud to have helped bring long-sought federal recognition to the Little Shell Tribe of Montana. But there is still a very long way to go. As the Vice Chair of the House Natural Resources Committee and the Chair of the sub Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands, I wake up each day with a fear that gnaws in my conscience, and that is the effects of climate change and how this crisis wreaks havoc on global communities who can least afford to adapt. 
I'm happy to know that NCAI created the Climate Action Task Force so that tribal nations are on the front line and ready to combat the effects of climate change on many levels. This, yes, that deserves an applause, Madam President. The sad fact is that we have a president who is intent on selling off our public lands to his friends for fracking and drilling. We have a president who has used his power to cut the size of Bears Ears National Monument by 85% and the size of Grand Staircase Escalante by half. These two areas, the ancestral homelands of my people, is now open to leases and desecration by extractive industries, which will exacerbate climate change and destroy countless sacred sites and erase our history. This administration, which is stacked with coal, gas, and oil insiders, has stopped important climate change research and actively promotes the denial of climate change and our need to move our country to a renewable energy economy. This is no different than the destruction of the Tohono O'odham Nation's sacred dance sites for the Trump border wall so he can further promote division in this country between people of color and in the process destroy a living culture and an irreplaceable wildlife habitat. But in spite of the immoral acts of this president and his administration toward our environment, the House passed bipartisan legislation to protect a 10 mile radius around Chaco Canyon from gas and oil drilling. The bill is currently in the Senate and I encourage all of you to support its passage. That means calling every single senator you know and asking them to make sure that this bill gets passed. Recently, the president signed an executive order creating the Operation Lady Justice Task Force, a plan that is modeled after my Not Invisible Act of 2019. Solving the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women is going to take a sustained, comprehensive effort between tribal, state, and federal governments, and I have concerns because the task force does not include the voices of survivors or tribal leaders. It lacks concrete transparency and consultation requirements, and if we are truly going to address this crisis, we need the administration to recognize the centuries of violence that Native people have endured, which won't be solved without concrete procedures and with only $1.5 million. In furtherance of, this, of his detrimental policies, the president is vehemently arguing for the federal court to allow him to kick off more than 700,000 people from food stamps. Many of these people reside in our communities and in urban areas. This action is wrong, and as a former SNAP beneficiary, I understand the value to health that adequate food can mean to families living on the edge. The work that we try to do in Indian country is not helped when tribal leaders have to struggle to be heard. They deserve a say in deciding the policies that the administration hands down that affect tribal nations. We have seen this time and again, and that's why I support the RESPECT Act, which is bipartisan and bicameral legislation that would mandate tribal consultation across all federal agencies and why I will work tirelessly to bring tribal leaders to the table to voice their concerns about proposed legislation and why I work to pass a tribal consultation amendment in the National Defense Authorization Act. While President Obama held tribal nation summits every year of his presidency, there has been little to no formal interaction with the needs of tribes by this administration. While tribes were against the Department of the Interior reorganization plan, it carried no weight and tribes were ignored. If we think for a moment about the Obama presidency and the fact that he moved more land into trust than any president, we can see a stark contrast between President Obama and this president. My office is open to all tribes, and I'd like to find solutions to the lack of the Interior Department's work on land into trust issues 
and reports of paperwork languishing without needed signatures, leading to tribes' frustration. But some hope looms in our ability to move legislation forward in a bipartisan way. I'll start with draft legislation that I worked on along with Senator Elizabeth Warren. Honoring Promises to Native Nations Act is draft legislation that is currently gaining comments from tribes across the country. This legislation will seek to remedy the decades-long underfunding that was exposed in the United States Commission on Civil Rights Broken Promises Report. The legislation will address chronic underfunding and, and neglect by the federal government in five major areas, criminal justice and public safety, healthcare, education, housing, and economic development. There is also missing and murdered indigenous people and violence prevention legislation that will begin to untangle the centuries long affliction that has taken hold and that must be remedied. I have co-sponsored and sponsored eight bills that if passed will move us toward finding solutions. Among these is the Badges Act, which will streamline the hiring of law enforcement officers in Indian country and the Not Invisible Act of 2019 that was the first bill in history to be introduced by four tribally enrolled members of Congress. <laughs> Currently, there are a number of bills in the Senate that need to move forward. They're, they're sitting on someone's desk and not doing a thing. And likely the most important bill to pass right now is the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. The House is pushing the Senate to move the bipartisan bill that we passed in April of 2019, that's almost a year, so that it can be signed into law because women have the right to be safe. In May, the House passed the Clean Cartieri Fix that Representative Tom Cole introduced to allow the Interior to take land into trust for tribes that were federally recognized at any point in time, not just when the Indian Reorganization Act was signed in 1934. This bill is important for the Senate to move forward because Congress did not intend to limit tribes' land into trust based on the date of their federal recognition. There are two extremely important issues that are critical to 2020, the census and the general election. I urge every tribe across this country to do all it can to ensure that our people are counted in this year's census. Funding that is important to the future of our communities is on the line if we neglect to be counted. It is especially challenging in states deemed hard to count by the Census Bureau However, a commitment to make the census a priority will ensure that Indian country doesn't leave funding that will make a positive difference in the lives of our children on the table. Last, this is an election year. As an organizer for close to two decades, I understand the challenges in getting our people to the polls. But this is the most important election in the history of our country. I take my oath of office to heart, and defending our Constitution and our democracy is my most important charge as a member of Congress. I have witnessed actions that I never thought possible by a President of the United States. And those actions, coupled with the brutal contempt for our environment, and most dangerous policies that have ripped families apart based only on the country of their origin, the president's disdain for decency and respect of human beings and our institutions are untenable. And I urge Indian country to devote every possible resource to electing a president who reflects the values that define us. Those values instilled in us by our parents and grandparents the values that guide our principal existence and demand that we care about whole communities, not just ourselves. 
that we give our children every opportunity so that they are prepared to keep our customs and traditions and then pass them on. The values that require us to protect and defend the land that is everything because it has sustained us for this long. Tribal leaders, please budget funds for the purpose of getting your people out to vote because our future depends on it. And I promise that I will do everything in my power to make sure that election security is a priority to every single member of Congress. I thank you all so much for listening. It's been an honor to spend time with you and I look forward to seeing some of you in my office this week. Thank you.